started here. Um, I prepared a special lecture today for that fish over there. <laughs> so this is going to be on fish antibiotics today. Okay, um, seriously. Um, okay, we're going to talk about antibiotics. This will be a part of a duet between myself and Dr. Mayer. I will cover uh, the cell wall antibiotics and he will cover the rest. Um, okay, um, I should point out that the title of this thing doesn't have the word sterilization in it anywhere or anything but antibiotics and there is a reason for that. Um, what we're going to basically do is uh, give some general terms over here, up to here but we're also going to discuss things that kill bacteria other than antibiotics and the reason there isn't a lot of time spent on this is not because they're unimportant because they're non-specific general ways of doing things and exactly what they do is not always known and in most cases it doesn't really matter anyway because they're so non-specific so there's not a lot to say and I will cover that first. When we get to the use of antibiotics, and antibiotics is a totally different situation as opposed to killing something with UV light or gamma radiation or, or phenol or what have you. They're very, very specific mechanisms that act on very specific sites within the bacterial cell. And they're usually, they're designed to basically act on something that bacteria have that people don't. Okay, so that's thinking. Because the idea is if you, if, you would, if you just basically use something totally non-specific that would work wonderfully in bacteria in a test tube, that doesn't mean squat when it comes to using it in a human being because it would, if it was great at killing bacteria and it was non-specific, it would kill you too. Okay, so that's why we're very concerned about specific modes of action on how antibiotics act. Now, in fact, there are really, there are a number of different places where bacteria, bacteria antibiotics, uh, antibiotics, antibiotics that will uh, just kill or stop the growth of bacteria act. The two primary ones are on the bacterial peptidoglycan and also on bacterial proteins, uh, on uh, protein biosynthesis. And the reasons are is because, there, as we've already discussed, we have, do not have peptidoglycan and bacteria do. So clearly that's a pretty good place to begin. And in the case of the protein biosynthesis, yes, bacteria do carry out protein biosynthesis, but we did discuss the fact of how different in lecture number one the ribosomes are and, the, and all their constituents thereof. The plain processes fundamentally go on, but there's enough differences that antibiotics will act there. And unfortunately the same problem comes in though that there's, there's a lot that whereas peptidoglycan is not there altogether and the enzymes involved in its biosynthesis, so that's a pretty good place to target. Of course, we do have ribosomes and so do bacteria. And so it's not a surprise, shouldn't be a surprise, that there's more possibility of toxicity with antibiotics that act, for example, on protein biosynthesis. And indeed, that is one of the big problems. I don't know, I don't know what, what Dr. Mayer will whether he'll get into this or not because he'll probably be focusing on mechanism. But anyway, regardless, it doesn't matter. That's the issue of what we're talking about with antibiotics, specificity. So I've got these terms here. Actually, it's term number one there, actually, that just relates to the general things I'm going to talk about, the things I'm going to talk about as regards how to kill bacteria in a non-specific way. And the rest of the lecture is concerned with specific ways to kill bacteria with antibiotics. Now, the thing is, is that um, it does, there aren't that many sites that you can, um, that you can, not, well, actually, there aren't that many sites, period, that one could find that are really totally unique to bacteria and not found in people. But, um, but the thing is that there are a, a only a relatively few that have actually been exploited by the pharmaceutical industry. And so the thing is, is that, as I said, uh, each, that we're, we're going to be focusing a lot on peptidoglycan biosynthesis today. And when I talk about one antibiotic versus another, it's going to sound, it sounds, if you just look at the words, it sounds very similar. But if you actually look at it figuratively, look at a picture, and that's what I've got today, you'll see that it isn't always the same way. So what I'm suggesting is look at the, you look at the PowerPoint, get the idea really what the differences are, and then there'll be more detail in the actual handout that will give you things that may not be in the PowerPoint presentation, okay? And that's really the idea. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at, you know, uh, each antibiotic and what uh, um, type and what they do. Now, there will be a lot more detail in pharmacology. Uh, you'll get this, in, I don't know if you've had this. I don't, have you had Steve Wilson's lectures in pharmacology? I don't remember the schedule quite honestly. Next semester, okay. 
Well, you'll get a lot more uh, detail on that side of things because that's what pharmacology, of course, is concerned with, is drugs. You know, we're concerned, we're here, we're microbiologists here, we're concerned with what the drugs do to the bacteria. So there's a different slant. So you'll get more information on the actual antibiotics themselves, some more detail than I'll give today. Okay, so that's the idea. All right, now um, let's go through. So these key words are all processes up to about uh, here. And then we start talking about individual types of antibiotics and what they do. And you'll note that this whole list here, right through to here, relates to beta-lactam beta antibiotics, which are things related to penicillin and structure. And the thing is, um, and so there's only, and then there's a few other antibiotics that don't act that way, uh, included for good measure. And we'll talk about those too. All right. Sterilization. Sterilization kills everything. That's the definition of sterilization. If you go to sterilize something and there's a certain number of bacteria in a sample and you sterilize it 99.9%, .9%, it is not sterile. There is no such thing as partially sterile or almost sterile. No, because a few bacteria in a sample put into a patient or an instrument put into a patient could potentially kill the patient. Okay? So that sterilization is what it says. They're killed. You've got live bacteria, you haven't sterilized. If it's 99.9% .9 or whatever, it's not sterile. And it's non-selective. Again, because um, you, know, you can do whatever you want to do. If, if it's a piece of equipment, or if it's a surface, or if it's a, um, a drug, you've got limits on, on whether you do some damage to the material you're dealing with, but you don't have the limits of, you know, do you do anything to the person? I mean, for example, the, major, the most common um, sterilization process is autoclaving, um, which essentially is a big pressure cooker where the, the, um, where the um, temperature actually gets to 121 degrees centigrade, above boiling point, due to the high pressure. And it, will, will, it, it kills everything. Now, the problem is, is that if you put something like a, a plastic beaker, that's uh, you know, the wrong sort of plastic in an autoclave, you end up with a blob afterwards. You know, it's a ball of plastic. So, I mean, it's not... So, the issue is, is that what we're talking about in using sterilization is, is really the, the material we're trying to sterilize. Okay, but you can get away with murder, basically, because you don't not... You're putting bacteria in the autoclave, you're not putting people in there. So, totally different situations. So, autoclaving is the most common, by far the most common way that's used to sterilize um, things. And it's simple and it's cheap. Water is very cheap. Steam is very cheap. Um, I will give you a contrast in a second. Okay, ethylene oxide uh, was also, is used in situations where you've got some, you, you basically don't want to damage the material. It may, it's, a, it's a piece of equipment that might be sensitive, that, for example, that you couldn't put into an autoclave and boil it at 121 degrees centigrade. Ultraviolet light is, is not very effective. It does not penetrate very well. And it's generally used to sterilize surfaces. When you put an ultraviolet light in an operating room, of course, when the people are not there, because you don't want to do, do the injury to yourself as well as the patient at the same time, when you put the ultraviolet light on, it doesn't penetrate very well. It doesn't get into nooks and crannies very well. It only surface. So the ultraviolet light cuts down the bacterial load. It doesn't really sterilize. We didn't hear too much in medical circles about gamma radiation until the last few years when the, when the Senate got very, un, very, very sort of uncomfortable about whether they were being attacked with anthrax or not. So gamma radiation, which had primarily been used in the food industry, um, became of some interest. And um, unfortunately, it is quite toxic. It was originally said not to be, but if anybody's ever seen a letter that's been gamma irradiated, they have shown the newspapers, they don't look much like letters after they've been gamma irradiated. So gamma radiation, it, and it's also extremely expensive. Um, m medical schools don't usually have gamma radiators strong enough to sterilize in that fashion. And one has to see, oh, we recently tried to use, uh, actually had something gamma radiated. Uh, it was around $1,500 for a few tubes, just, just a few little tubes. So it's not something that you would really generally use, not because it's not, it's not a, a reasonable way to do things, it's just not too many of us have got $1,500 a pop every time we want to sterilize something. We can just use steam. So, okay, so the situation, that's the, these are the general sort of, they're very general. 
And and to talk about mechanism, as far as I'm concerned, when you're talking about boiling something or or steam, putting in a steam pressure or gamma radiation, is really, you know, there's not a lot to say. So I'm going to leave, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. These are general ways to do things. Uh, I do want to member, mention membrane, membrane filtration because it's a very useful thing to do. And it's what we do, we've got things that, are, that we want to be very, very gentle and we don't want to give it subjected to gamma radiation or UV light or ethylene oxide or what have you. Actually, excuse me, before I should go on, um, re- and recently there's a number of issues been tra- coming up to try and replace ethylene oxide and I've just mentioned that here and particularly what's being used is things like uh, hydrogen peroxide and there are sort of um, instruments that will generate free radicals from hydrogen peroxide and these will no doubt become very commonplace over the years they've been introduced for m- mainly over the last few years and there are other alternatives ethylene oxide is the real thing that has to be replaced because it's considered to be tight toxic and the residues can be left over in the material, and it's just that's the issue. Um, all the clothing has, has been around forever, and it will continue to be, as will ultraviolet light, and gamma radiation has its own uses. But this one is gradually disappearing. Okay? Um, all right, membrane filtration. Basically, what you do is you have a steri- filter that's already been sterilised, perhaps in an autoclave, probably in an autoclave, and you would simply take the, solu- the solution that contains, let's say you've got something that you, as a protein or um, some material that just can't take being heated and you want to get, you don't want to make sure there's no bacteria present, you pour it through a filter that's got little pores in it and the pores are smaller than the size of the bacteria so they get trapped on the top of the pore and the liquid goes through and doesn't have any bacteria. And that's millipore filtration or membrane filtration. And it's very simple, and most many, some of you have probably used a membrane filter at some point, but that's a very, I think, a useful thing to do. Okay, um, now we talked about sterilisation, which, as I said, by definition, you, your, your goal in sterilisation is 100% killing. Um, disinfection is when we're talking about a surface. Now, um, disinfection will be done on something like a, a laboratory, laboratory bench, or, or something, you know, you clean it, or, a, or, a, or in a hospital. Um, it's not, the, 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 the things that are used for disinfection are too toxic for use on the skin. And that's really the issue why we use a separate term for disinfection. So it's really when you're trying to kill bacteria in a, on, a, on a surface in particular where, you, where basically it doesn't come into contact with you. That's disinfection. As opposed to the word antiseptic, an antiseptic, in, in contrast, by definition, will be a situation you use to sterilise a skin surface. Now, you, you know, you, you, you're limited in what you can do. Iodine or 70% alcohol are most commonly used. Yes, it would be very nice to put six normal hydrochloric acid on somebody's skin. It would probably do a wonderful job in killing the bacteria, you know, but you probably wouldn't have much skin left afterwards. So, by definition, when you're using an antiseptic, it has to be something that can, that's fairly toxic, but it can't be too toxic. And so we, we, it's obvious if you think about it that you couldn't possibly sterilise the skin by using something like 70% alcohol or iodine. It cuts the load down. It, it, it makes it less likely that you're going to get an infection. And even the, and in fact, the rubbing action itself may be just as, maybe, maybe it's also probably important, just the fact of washing the skin surface with something that's not contaminated. But you don't want to be under the impression that you're totally sterilising. And of course you couldn't be because the most common place you can catch a bacterial infection is in the hospital. And the reason it's the most common place to catch an infection is because of the fact that people are in pretty bad shape already and they're susceptible. And if we were totally sterilising everything we did and it never came in contact with a person, then how on earth would you see opportunistic infections in hospitals, okay? So just realise what you do. It's a good thing to do. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. I'm saying it's a very good thing to do. Just don't be in any illusions that you're what you're doing when you, when you clean a wound surface. Okay, now there's a lot to say about antibiotics in contrast. So we've dealt with the concept of sterilisation, of disinfection, of antisepsis. Now we're going to deal with antibiotics, where we're now we're talking about specificity. We're not just talking about denaturing something with phenol, you know, or, or hydrolyzing it with sulfuric acid. We're talking about um, specificity. Antibiotics, by definition, are selectively toxic for bacteria. If it doesn't do that, there are, people talk about they discovered some drug in the laboratory and it was wonderful at killing bacteria. Big whoop. But what does it do in a human being? 
because if it, or an animal, because if it's toxic, it doesn't matter how effective it is at killing a microbe, it has to be very good at not doing damage to you. Okay? So that's what, that's what we think of as an antibiotic. Now, there are two terms that are, are used. Um, I think a lot of times they, they, they use perhaps too much, but let's define them anyway. Bactericidal refers to killing. Bactericidal means you actually killed the bacteria. Bacteriostatic refers to growth inhibition, that you've actually stopped the bacterial growth. By bactericidal, what it really means is if I put an antibiotic in with an organism and then I remove the antibiotic, the, the, the organism is not going to start growing again because it's dead. Bacteriostatic would mean if I put the, the antibiotic in with the organism and I remove the antibiotic, it would probably start growing again because it would only stop growing when the antibiotic was there. So that's the difference between the terms bactericidal and bacteriostatic. And again, the whole issue here is here, you know, is the, is the physician's, you know, sort of oath. No harm must occur to the patient. That's the basis of what we do with an antibiotic. So antibiotics directly or indirectly are in, result in the destruction of structures that are present in bacteria and not present in the host. Okay? And of course, that's, a, that's what you desire. But it's not necessarily what happens. One of the reasons that people often use penicillin antibiotics, uh, lactam antibiotics like penicillin as their first choice is because they're relatively, they're pretty non-toxic. The aminoglycosides that Dr. Mayer will discuss can be, in some instances, very toxic. And, they, and so a lot of times you'll use aminoglycosides commonly, but when you have to use them, rather than because you want to use them. So I say again, I don't, you know, antibiotics in theory should have no toxicity, but that doesn't mean they necessarily don't. I also want to point out that antibiotics work together with the immune system, and, you know, and it wasn't a waste that you had 24 hours of immunology. It does relate to bacteriology, it does relate to virology, it means something. The antibiotics do interact with the immune system. The antibiotics will cut down, for example, in some instances, the bacterial load. They may not necessarily be totally effective. But then the immune system comes along and finishes, finishes the bacteria off. And that's why it's so difficult with somebody why to treat bacterial infections in an immunocompromised individual. You can load, you know, you theoretically just load somebody up with antibiotics and, you know, keep it in there and they'll be fine. Well, no, they won't. If you keep, so load somebody up with antibiotics who's got a, who's immunocompromised, you're certainly going to help. But you can't, but you are not going to substitute for having an effective immune system. So antibiotics work together with the immune system, not instead of. Okay, now we did, we did we, I gave you a picture the other day of um, minimal inhibitory concentration, the MIC. Basically, um, you know, there's a limit, you know, you can't give, uh, you know, somebody, you know, you can't give somebody a pound of antibiotics. I mean, there's a, there's a you know, the, there's a certain concentration that an antibiotic needs to be at to be effective. And by definition, the minimal inhibitory concentration is the lowest level that stops bacterial growth. There are two ways of doing this, basically. One way I showed you, and you go back to the, uh, what lecture was it now? I don't even remember. Um, but anyway, there's a picture in one of the earlier lectures showing you um, how the, um, yeah, it was in my second lecture on, on bacterial um, diagnosis in the labor, my clinical microbiology laboratory. And it showed how um, you use a disc and the zone of inhibition around the disc to, to determine um, susceptibility. And in the case of a disc, what you do, as I said earlier, is that the, first, you put it, the antibiotic is sitting in the middle of the disc and the, the, more, effective the, a, the, the more effective the antibiotic is, uh, the, the, um, the further away from the disc you will see the bacteria not growing. The other way to do things, and so go back to that figure and take a look at it uh, later on. The other thing is, is that uh, you can just simply take an antibiotic and simply put it in a tube and then make a doubling dilution and make another, and then have a series of tubes with different concentrations of antibiotics and just simply inoculate bacteria into the tubes and see what grows. Okay, so that's um, basically the two ways you do it. Uh, again, you've all been out by now, looked at the handouts and looked at the slides and I remind you, I'm not trying to cover every word of the handout in these slides because if I did, we'd get nothing done and we'd be here the rest of the week for each, slot, each lecture. The goal is to get the big point here in the lectures to guide you so when you go back and look at the words, it's easier to take it in. 
Okay, so there are more details in the handouts. Um, antibiotics that, as I say, that inhibit cell wall biosynthesis are bactericidal. Now, let's re we've made this point a number of times, but let's put it in this context. An antibiotic that inhibits cell wall biosynthesis means, by definition, you don't have a wall. As soon as you don't have a wall, the cells are going to burst. A burst cell is no cell. Okay, so you get rid of the antibiotic, they're not going to start growing again. Okay, that's why they're usually bactericidal. The cell wall is destroyed, they're usually bactericidal. Okay. Um, let's remind, now we're going to remind ourselves the two slides when we covered in the last lecture and we're going to get into the details of how what antibiotics do and how they differ from one another mechanistically. Okay, we've discussed already that the bacterial cell wall consists of three components, the glycan backbone, the peptide side chains, and the cross bridges. We've discussed the fact that this is not always just a single peptide bond. It's just shown there are bacterial peptidoglycans that do just have a single peptide bond. But we've discussed the fact that this might not be in some instances where you look and you might, there might be another peptide here. But mechanistically, the only thing we care about is the fact that we've got two chains that are held together by a crosslink, because that's what holds the whole thing together. If that crosslink is gone, if that peptide bond is lysed, then we have a bunch of little pieces of cell wall and no bacteria there, because the whole thing falls apart. Now, this shows you, I've labeled that as old and new, because it, it, does, it makes things a little easier. If we look at the new, the new one here, you'll see that there are actually five, there are actually, um, Actually, there are, excuse me, the, the glycan part's not shown here. There are five amino acids shown here, the peptide side chain, and the glycan part would be up there. But there are five amino acids here. You'll see that there are, there are five amino acids here. When the new one inserts itself into the old wall, you'll see that a bond, this bond wasn't here already. That bond, the transpeptidation occurs. One peptide bond is formed but at the same token, there has to be a peptide gone, peptide bond gone, because there's not the possibility of having two peptide bonds if there's only one carboxyl group there. So the dealanine falls off. And that's why I made a big emphasis about the dealanine, dealanine, because that's the site of a lot of the antibiotics that we're going to talk about in how they, uh, how mechanistically how they work. And that's why you can make a simple statement, some are pentapeptides and some are, some are tetrapeptides, but that's why. Okay. All right. So now we'll, get, we'll, we'll go along, and we're going to. So this is the slide I showed yesterday, and this is the um, the beginning now. Next next few slides we'll talk about mechanism. All right. I remind you again, the uh, the sugars are in green. I'm sorry. The sugars are in red, and the amino acids are in green. And I've made the um, um, there's a different colour purposely from that because I want you to see where the old stuff is and where the new, uh, the, the new stuff is and where the old stuff is. And I made these two a different colour because I want to emphasise the terminal dialanines. Okay, so the, we see that in the cytoplasm, the individual unique sugars, such as ceramic acid, the unique D amino acids we discussed earlier are synthesised, and then they're put together into subunits. We then see that the subunits are then made into bigger subunits in the cell membrane on an undercaprin or a lipid carrier that they're covalently bound to and that is a big issue, this covalent bond. We're going to talk about that as one of the sites of antibiotic action. The thing, they pass over to the other side of the membrane and then they come off. That's why this shows you here, note that you see the membrane, the undercaprin in the membrane is free, it gets the cell wall, it comes off again and then it recycles back. Now, and then we see here that we just discussed again already the glycan backbone with the new cell wall inserted. And that's why we need all the lysins, because if you, if, you, if, you, if, this, if you couldn't punch a hole here to insert this new peptidoglycan subunit, if there was no hole there, no gap, you could, there's nothing, no way you could insert it. So I'll remind you again that there are enzymes, also lysins they're referred to, but they're really, they're really just, they're, they're part of the synthetic process. There are enzymes that are designed to, to punch holes and there are other enzymes that are involved in inserting the new pieces. And I've purposely chosen not to name these enzymes and there is a whole series of them. Um, 
But I, what is important is you get the, the picture of what they do. Okay, let's start with cyclosyrene. This is an analogue of alanine. I didn't say an analogue of dialanine. I didn't say an analogue of L-alanine because it doesn't make a blind bit of difference. It's an analogue of alanine. It inhibits conversion of l ala to d ala the, the normal l alanine made by, you know, by the cells, any cell, is converted to the unique form of d alanine In addition, we have to make a d alanine the alanine dipeptide. Now, I didn't say, in, when I've said here in the next figure, I didn't say that it acts. That's one, that's one enzymatic reaction, and that's another enzymatic reaction. And it doesn't matter which one it acts on or both, because the same, the same result's going to be there. And it's going to happen, this, when one happens, the other thing's going to happen by definition. So I don't want any lawyers in the room when, I'm, when we're having some of the quizzes later, okay? So look at how it works, okay? All right, now let's look at it carefully. And most medical students I know are not lawyers. I understand that, but there are always a few lawyers in the room. There are some. <laughs> okay, now look, let's look at the situation. All right, here we are in the cytoplasm. Yes, I've done this a while, and yes, I do, I have, do not have a crystal ball, but I know the future. Okay, um, all right, cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, we've make, we're making these uh, individual monomers, okay, the amino acids and the sugars. This, one of the enzymes is stopping the conversion of L-alanine to D-alanine. That's why the crosses are there. There's no D-alanine. Now, it, the, enzyme, the, the, the cyclosyrian, if we get unlucky, and this does, isn't totally effective, and there were, for example, there was a little bit of D-alanine around for whatever reason, it also acts in a different place. And it actually acts on the, inhibits the synthesis of the dipeptide. Okay? Now, it does do both. And in either case, as I say again, there are two sites of action, but whether you don't have dialanine there or you don't have a dialanine dipeptide there, the result is the same. You don't have a dialanine dipeptide at the end. Okay? So I'm stressing again, there are two sites of action, they're both important, and they're both um, going on at the same time. Okay, that's the site of action of cyclosyrene. Note the emphasis on dialanine. I mean, we've already, we've already had just one antibiotic. With, you know, we're, we're on the dialanine, okay. Now, baxitracin, on the other hand, um, and I'm doing, what I'm doing here is I'm going through the, the process of the stages of the synthesis of peptidoglycan, okay, where they act, okay, rather than any other sort of order. This is the order. First of all, the, the synthesis of the subunit, then passes through the membrane. The baxitracin inhibits dephosphorylation. What does that mean? Okay, let's look at it pictorially. We're in the middle part now, the second stage, in the membrane. Again, there's a phosphate group there. That was that linkage I mentioned earlier. There's a phosphate group there. It's a phosphodiester bridge. That subunit has to be covalently attached to that pactoprenol or undercaprinol is the other word for it. It's actually physically passed through the membrane. When it gets to the other side, the, the subunit comes off and you end up with a phosphorylated undercaprinol. Now, it doesn't matter a bean if that gets passed back to the other side or not, because that phosphate group is attached, because if that phosphate group is attached, you cannot get any new subunit to be attached. So, baxitracin inhibits dephosphorylation. And you can memorise that, but what I also want you to understand is what it means. Okay? All right, so that's what baxitracin does. Now we're back to dialanine, dialanine, but we're in a different part of the process. We've moved from the cytoplasm to the cell membrane, and now we're at the wall. The vancomycin binds to dialanine, dialanine. I didn't, it does, I didn't say it inhibits the synthesis. I didn't say anything else. I didn't say that can enzymes, anything you can imagine. I specifically said it binds to the dialanine, dialanine. Okay? So although we're, we're involving dialanine here, it's not the same way that cyclosyrene acts. It has nothing to do with the way that cyclosyrene acts. In this case, the vancomycin is actually binding to the dialanine, dialanine, and inhibiting cross-linking. Because this is an enzymatic process, as we've already said, in which we remove a, um, in which this new bond is formed between that cross-bridge and that dialanine, and that you have to get the removal of the second dialanine. That is an enzymatic reaction. If that vancomycin is sitting there physically blocking the dialanine, dialanine, and there's no way that an enzyme can work. 
Okay? So although we use, it, yes, the question would be, um, we are, in, in both instances, cyclosterine and vancomycin do involve the dialanine, dialanine. But if you look at the mechanism, they've got nothing to do with each other. Okay? So, I, want, I suggest strongly, and some of you, you know, many of you, are, you know, we're well, all smart people, I'm sure that you wouldn't, I say you wouldn't be in medical school, I've said that before. But there's a lot of material covered quickly. If you don't get it now, go home and look at the slides one at a time and make sure you understand it. And then go back to the handouts and look for the details because there are more details in the handouts. And that's really the way it is with most of my lectures. Okay. Now, in contrast to the... Now, the biggie, the biggie among the, um, the um, antibiotics that act on peptidoglycan biosynthesis are the penicillins. And the word, and it does say penicillins and not penicillin. Because there's lots and lots and lots of different penicillins. And they've got lots of wonderful names and I don't know most of them. And by the time you've been in practice two or three years, you'll know everyone under the sun. You'll have heard of them and be using them. Okay? And there'll be a bunch more probably by the time you're on, you know, you're out there than there is now. They're always changing. Because bacteria, unfortunately, they adapt and we have to adapt to them. So the key word is penicillins. The, stand, the, the primary penicillin at the beginning was, was called penicillin, but there are lots and lots of different penicillins and they oftentimes have names that don't look anything like that. As the years have gone by, you know, the pharmaceutical industry has done this to make life difficult for physicians, medical microbiologists and medical students. And we have lots and lots of other things related to these things. And we have the cephalosporins, which are different structurally to the penicillins, but they all have a beta-lactam ring. Okay? We have other things, cephamycins, which are slightly different in structure also to the penicillins, but again, they all have a beta-lactam ring. The monobactams are different in structure. Again, they all have a beta-lactam ring. The function of any of these things is to inhibit what's called penicillin binding proteins and stop cross-linking. Now, the word penicillin binding protein is, a, is, is I think a bit, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's true, but the implication when you see the word penicillin, the word penicillin binding protein is that the function of these, of these proteins is to bind penicillin, which is totally asinine. Uh, what they, they do bind penicillin. There are enzymes, there are enzymes such as the autolysins, the, the, um, the, the, the um, transpeptidases and what have you that are involved in peptidoglycan biosynthesis. And by bad luck, as regards the bacteria anyway, they happen to be, um, these penicillin binding proteins do indeed bind penicillin. You'll understand in a second why. And the thing is, is that these penicillin binding proteins inhibit cell wall biosynthesis just like all the other antibiotics we've discussed so far. Okay, so they, yes, they bind penicillin. Yes, penicillin binding proteins bind penicillin, but their function is they're involved in cell wall biosynthesis, particularly cross-linking. Okay, so this is different than we just said. And I want any illusions here. Here we've got this brown box, which is the vancomycin, binding to the dialanine, dialanine. Okay, here we have a totally different... The effect is the same, the result is the same, the mechanism is totally different. In this instance, the penicillin is not binding to the dialanine, dialanine. It's binding to the penicillin binding protein, the enzyme that's involved in the cross-linking. It doesn't matter if the, if the active side of the enzyme can't come into contact with its substrate, you won't get cross-linking. It doesn't matter if it's blocked by binding to the dialanine, dialanine, or if it's blocked by the penicillin binding to the active site of the enzyme. In either case, you're going to get inhibition of um, cross-linking. Okay, so don't be confused just because it says dialanine, dialanine, etc., etc. You know now that there are two different mechanisms. And here's, these are the beta-lactam antibiotics we're talking about. And in the handout, it mentions uh, all of the ones I'm discussing now. It may mention another one or two, I can't remember. So look at the handout as well. Beta-lactam antibiotics. Now, the reason these antibiotics work is because it turns out that if you look at the structure of dialanine, dialanine, the dipeptide, and I didn't say dialanine, the monomer, if you look at the structure of dialanine, dialanine, the, di the dipeptide, there's, there's a structural similarity to the, in three dimensions to the lactam ring of, an, of these types of antibiotics. In fact, the peptide bond in between the dialanine, dialanine 
seems to be basically physically in the same sort of space that the, that the peptide bond would be um, in, a, in a beta-lactam ring. And so these things actually, um, so these, uh, that's the reason they, they, they bind to the penicillin binding proteins and that's the reason that they act. In a sense, you could, a sense you could say they are um, analogues of the D-alanine, D-alanine dipeptide. And again, I didn't say they're analogues of D-alanine. And I stress that point because it's not, as opposed to the cycloserine, which is an analogue of the alanine. Okay? Now, that may, I'm sure this is very confusing. Go ahead. That's it there. Right. So, I'll show you the structure in a second. Okay, this is your beta-lactam here. It's, a, it's, it's an analogue of that structure there. That's binding to the active side of the enzyme. Because that, that, that lactam is there, it, the enzyme can't bind to that. Okay, so typical, it's a typical competitive, competitive inhibition that you've had in biochemistry. Okay? That's a good question. Okay? Is everybody clear on that? Okay. First time I've ever used the word competitive inhibition, I think, in 30 years since I took a biochemistry talk. Okay, all right. Next. All right, structure of penicillin. Now, this, is, this will give you more of the information that you would, we need. This why you have to look at things pictorially instead of words, because I think pictures help a lot. Here's the beta-lactam ring. It's a four-membered ring. Okay? Now, that's not the big deal. That's the structure we really care about. That's an amide linkage, just like you would find in between dialanine and dialanine. And that bond seems to be sitting out there in space in just such a way that the, it, you know, that it looks to the, 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 the enzyme it looks like the peptide bond between the two dialanines. Okay? And that's why it's essentially is a, um, it's a competitive inhibitor. Okay? Now, any, any of these names that you see, and you will recognize pretty quickly which ones are beta-lactam antibiotics, not in this course, but when you've been exposed for a few years, um, they all work the same way. Okay? And you might say to yourself, well, why do we have thousands of these things? You know? Well, the reason we do is very simple. is because this structure is the active site. But that doesn't mean it's going to do anything because it's got to get to the bacteria and it's got to survive in the bloodstream or the tissues, wherever it's got to get to. And these side arms, which are all sorts of things floating around here, this is just one example, these side arms and what have you determine whether something will have a long half-life in the bloodstream, whether it will penetrate the blood-brain barrier, whether, you know, there are all sorts of other issues that come into this. And I'm not... This, again, is not a pharmacology course, okay? So, you'll get that later. But what I'm emphasising here is this part, the beta-lactam ring, okay? Because that's the site that, that acts on the bacteria. Now, some bacteria, they say, hey, you know, um, I don't want to die, I'm not suicidal. They actually make things called penicillinases that will dis break, destroy this structure. And that's one of the mechanisms of antibiotic resistance, breakage of the beta-lactam ring. Okay, so that is the beta-lactam ring, that structure there. You need to be able to recognise it. It's not very difficult. There aren't many places in nature you see a four-carbon ring instead of a five- or a six-carbon ring. This is a five-carbon ring, the second part of the, of the uh, structure of a penicillin. In the case of a cephalosporin, it will be a six, it will be a six, not six carbon, excuse me, a five-membered ring. In the case of a cephalosporin, it will be a six-membered ring. What's the joke? Share it, please. <laughs> You've had this before, obviously. Sorry? Sorry? Well, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. The next person in this room that gets 100% on the exam, let me know, okay? <laughs> okay, nobody's perfect. Go ahead. What's that? To do what? Let me know you made 100%. <laughs> <laughs> but sure. <laughs> there won't be many of you, I don't think. <laughs> okay, yeah, now this is called, is a, uh, is a, is a, is a five-membered ring, not a five-carbon ring. Now, the other the issue is that's a sulfur up there, whereas in the case of the, of the, um, of the um, uh, carbon penines, I think it is, it's an oxygen, not a, not a sulfur there. Okay, and I, that's in the handout too. All right, so I, I, I think that what I'm really getting at is when you're looking at these structures, what I would suggest to you is do this. Look at the four-membered ring 
look at the five or six membered ring, ask the question, is there a sulfur there or is an oxygen there? And recognize that any of these structures could have all sorts of weird and wonderful things that organic chemists love to make attached to these things. Okay? All right. Um, okay, uh, that's the, the, uh, uh, that's the penicillins. And so the pen the, they have five membered rings attached to the lactam ring. The cephalosporins have a six membered ring and the monobactams don't have a, a second ring. They just have a lactam ring. Okay? So take a look in the handout. There's more details there. There's not much more there in the handout, but that's what you need, that's what you need to focus on. Okay, and as I said already, chemical modifications change biological activity. Okay? The early lactam antibiotics were inactive against gram-negative bacteria because they could not penetrate the outer membrane. And one of the major changes that was made to was to change the, the, um, the, the fact the outer membrane doesn't let hydrophobic substances pass through very well. It will let hydrophilic molecules such as carbohydrates and amino acids through the porins will pass through very easily. And so the changes in the structure of the side chains was to make the antibiotics more hydrophobic so they could pass through the outer membrane. Okay? And again, that's what this issue comes into. And, it, and, it, and I really do think it's ridiculously complex unless somebody is in the pharmaceutical industry and making antibiotics. I think it's trying, you know, there's just so many terms and combinations and they're of you. I think it's, it's beyond the scope of human beings. Um, and by the way, uh, I am a chemist by background and I love chemistry, <laughs> but I don't see why I should inflict that on you. Okay, um, all right. Next. Um, okay, the, um, let's move on. Okay, resistance mechanisms. Uh, they produce beta-lactamases, I said already, penicillinases, certain bacteria that are resistant. This is resistant mechanisms we're talking about. Penicillinases are enzymes produced by certain bacteria that will destroy these, uh, the antibiotic. We can also have modified penicillin binding proteins that don't bind the antibiotic. And I stress again, these are part of peptidoglycan biosynthesis is what they're involved in. And you know what, specifically what enzyme, not the name, but what by, by site and mechanism I'm talking about. There can also be modifications in the porins so that an antibiotic would simply not be able to get through because you already can't get through the membrane part very easily, and if the porins are affected, then that really can totally stop something getting through the other membrane in a selective fashion. Um, clavulinic acid is also a beta-lactin, but, it, it, but it has very little activity as an antibiotic, and it's usually used along with another antibiotic so that the clavulinic acid will bind to the um, things like a the penicillinase, for example, stop the penicillinase but the other active drug will, um, you know, will keep on doing what it's supposed to do. So it's often used in conjunction. Okay, so that's the way it binds strongly to beta-lactamase, inhibiting activity, but it's not generally used as a primary antibiotic. Okay, um, now every, basically, you know, we've been here now for 45 minutes, and of that 45 minutes, I think I spent five minutes on um, sterile, on, on things not to do with antibiotics in general terms and I've spent 40 minutes uh, on things relating to peptidoglycan biosynthesis. It, it doesn't take much to imagine that, that that's the, you know, the, where the major emphasis is. All right, we've got, now what we're going to cover is uh, some other things that have got nothing to do with peptidoglycan biosynthesis, just two slides, because there just aren't many antibiotics that don't act on the... Uh, the, uh, the anti uh, Antibiotics that are involved in inhibiting the biosynthesis of bacterial cell walls generally act on the inhibiting the synthesis of peptidoglycan. An exception is polymyxin B. Polymyxin B binds to lipid A. It also unfortunately binds to phospholipids because I've already said that lipid A is a glucosamine disaccharide with hydroxy fatty acids in covalent linkage. Lipid A is a couple of sugars with some fatty acids attached. It's not that different than a phospholipid, at least the, the fatty acid part isn't. So it's not a surprise that it binds to phospholipids also. So polymyxin B can be quite toxic for that reason. It generally isn't used internally, but, when it, but it is used clinically and it disrupts outer membranes. And uh, specifically, knowing, as you all know by now very well, that lipid A is a component of lipopolysaccharides. We don't find lipopolysaccharides anywhere in bacteria except in gram-negative bacteria. You know, as soon as, if I hadn't even written this down here, you would be able to tell me without that information that this acted on a gram, that only on gram-negative bacteria, right? 
He says, I don't know about that. Anyway, okay. So that's the point. Again, if you get the basic stuff, everything else fits on top of it. Okay? Now, this is toxic to human cells for the reasons that I've just given, and so it would not be a first-line drug in most situations for that reason. And by choice, you'll be using aminoglycosides or tetracycline or something else that Dr. Mayer knows a lot more than I know about and we'll talk about later. All right, so that's polymyxin B. Nothing to do with peptidoglycan biosynthesis. It, acts on lipid, on, it binds to lipid A. It has a very strong affinity for lipid A and it disrupts the outer membranes of gram-negative but not gram-positive bacteria. Tuberculosis is a particularly difficult disease to treat. There are 20,000 odd new cases of tuberculosis in this country every year and there are millions of cases of tuberculosis and le leprosy, a related disease, in the world also. And so it's not just that the pharmaceutical industry thought it would be fun to make some antibiotics that were, that were primarily used against treating tuberculosis and also other drugs that will act on leprosy. Um, the point is this organism grows extremely slowly and it takes uh, some regimens about nine months, some regimens are about two years to treat somebody with tuberculosis because the organism grows so slowly and, form, and gets hidden away in granulomas and macrophages and what have you. And so um, you can develop resistance during this time period and, and so drugs have had to be designed that's, and there are also a lot of cases of, of, um, of, um, in this country of mycobacteria that are resistant to most common drugs. So these are particularly drugs against tuberculosis. I'm not saying it's the only place you'd ever use them, okay? but they're particularly used against tuberculosis and there are three of them, isoniazid, ethambutol and ethaniamid. Isoniazid and ethaniamid are chemically related and they block mycolic acid synthesis. We talk about specificity. The only case in nature that you're going to find, um, you know, I mean, you're going to find a bacteria of mycolic acid, so these organisms, mycolic acid, so these are analogues of mycolic acid. Irabinoglactan is not so unusual, it's just a boring polysaccharide, but this ethambutol does block the synthesis of arabinoglactan, specifically found in the cell wall of mycobacteria. Okay, so that's why these drugs are specifically used, for the reasons I've just given, to treat tuberculosis. Okay, so don't go confusing from this, this point on polymyxin B to the end. They've got nothing to do with the peptidoglycan biosynthesis we've been talking about up to this point. Okay, that's that. I realise that was a lot of drugs and a lot of mechanisms, but if you, and I say, just take a look at the pictures, and once you see that, once you look at it in your own time, you won't have any trouble with this. 